Welcome to the Recovery Effect Podcast with Bill Vineyard. Recovery is Bill's passion and his life's work of 30 plus years. Now it's your turn to experience the Recovery Effect, a powerful mix of recovery, spirituality, philosophy, and most importantly, living life as your true self. Now here's your host, Bill Vineyard. I have been blessed and privileged to know him, the greatest Christian theologian of our times. I met him when he worked in a bookstore here in Wichita. I used to go down to that bookstore and we used to sit and talk almost on a daily basis. I remember one time I asked him, I said, Dale, if we really believed in God and eternal life, why are we not totally spending all we have on obtaining this? His reply stunned me. He said, because we're fools. You know, that's a simplistic answer, but you know, it's very profound. It's because we're fools. But I think it's even more than that. As I thought about this, yes, we're fools, but why are we fools? Because somewhere deep within us, we really don't believe. We're kind of hedging our bet. We'd like to believe, but not believe. Hold on to this life and hold on to the next one, which is no belief at all, really. Once I figured that out for myself, I asked myself, why didn't I believe? Well, if I really believe, then that means that I'm going to have to change. I might have to give up something I don't want to, or I might lose something that I love, and I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is believe and not believe. I'm going to try to do those both at the same time so I can hold on to both of them. Well, that is being a fool. And you know what? I feel this is the same way that people who don't work this program or refuse to accept and adopt spiritual principles feel. They say they just don't believe in them. They don't want to give up the principles and the character that they have because they don't believe that adopting these spiritual principles and changing their character will benefit them. They feel in some ways that God wants them bored and miserable for the rest of their life. I was in session the other day, or it was about a week ago, and there was this lady that said that she had tried this program two or three times and it just didn't work for her. And as we talked, I asked her what was wrong, and she kept saying this and that. And she said, Bill, I just don't believe this program will work for me. And she kept on talking, and as she's talking, I was sitting there thinking, why doesn't she believe that? I mean, there's so much evidence showing it does work. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people that have received great benefits from working this program. It's all over the world. I mean, because of this program, I think there's 32 or 36 other programs that's developed because of it. It's helped people with eating disorders, sexual disorders. It's helped drug addicts by developing NA and CA and those kind of programs. I mean, why would that woman sit there and not believe that this thing works in the face of all this overwhelming evidence? And then it hit me. The reason that she chooses to believe it doesn't work is because she doesn't want to stop drinking. There I go, giving another simplistic answer, but I believed in my heart it was true, and I even checked it out. When she finished speaking, I said, do you think there's a possibility that you don't want to change, that you don't really want to stop drinking? And she smiled, that little devilish smile, like she'd been caught, and said, yeah, there is a part of me in the back of my mind that thinks that maybe I'll be able to do what my other friends do, And it's just hard to give up going to the bars and hanging out with my friends. Well, see, she can't afford to believe that this program works. She can't afford to adopt the 12 steps, the principles of recovery, because, see, she'd have to give up something she wants. Therefore, instead of having to give that up, she's just going to believe that the program won't work. As I was driving home after that session, I was thinking about that, and it hit me. I'm the same way she is. When I'm faced with having to give up something or lose something or not get something I want in order to adopt a spiritual principle, I usually hedge on that bet. I want to accept part of that spiritual principle and just give up a little bit of what I have. I'm just like her. Or I'll say to myself, I don't think that's the right principle for me to adopt right now. I don't think I'm going to do that. That would just cause too much pain in my life, and I'm sure God doesn't want me to have that much pain. I think the root of that problem is that I don't believe God wants what's best for me, or at least I doubt that. I somehow think that what I want is better for me than what he wants. I think that if I give this up and accept this spiritual principle, it's going to cause me more pain and less pleasure, and I don't want that. 
But when in fact my history shows that every time I've given stuff up or given something up and accepted the principle, I've received way more pleasure and less pain. But yet I go on thinking the way I'm thinking. I can vividly remember when I first got into AA, when I used to get somewhat angry when I would hear things like go to any length or let go absolutely or completely give yourself or abandon yourself to God. I thought I was giving up myself and that I would be like a non-entity if I abandoned myself to God or if I completely give myself. And this stopped me and hindered me from getting sober and finding some joy in my life because I wouldn't do this. Because, see, it was really hard to trust that what God wanted for me was better than what I wanted for me. This attitude rolled on to my sponsor, too. Me and him used to get into fights. I remember one time sitting out on his front porch. He told me I needed to quit doing something. And I told him, I got to get up. I got to go use the restroom. And I got up and went through his front room, went out his kitchen door, got my car and drove off. I mean, it was that kind of thing. I didn't want to give up what he was asking me to give up. But you know what? He asked me to give up that because he knew how much good it would bring into my life. But I didn't trust him. I didn't trust that. I thought he was stupid. One of the hardest spiritual principles that I was taught in my first year of sobriety was that if you have a resentment against someone, pray every day for that person and ask God to give him exactly what you want and do that for about two weeks. I was told that you didn't have to mean it. You just had to do it. Well, I'm telling you, folks, I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. But I did want to stay sober. So every morning, I had this one really great resentment. And I would get out on my knees, and I would pray for this person every day. And I would ask God to give that person everything I wanted. Well, two weeks went by, and it wasn't much better. It took about a year for that thing to leave with praying for it every day. But you know, I can remember the exact moment it left. I just felt this overwhelming peace inside of me. It had left me. And you know what? As an extra added benefit, I meant what I wanted for that person. When I prayed that prayer from that day forth, I really wanted it for that person. Now that's a total turnaround from when I started that process. At first, I rebelled against doing it. I wanted to hold on to that resentment. I was justified in holding on to that. And so I fought that spiritual principle of praying for that person. But once I surrendered to that principle, look at the results. I was astonished at the results. I never knew that was going to happen to me. And it felt so good. My life was better as a result of following that spiritual principle than it would have been if I'd have got even for what that person did to me. Some of us even rebel against the simple principles that it takes to get clean and sober. Go to meetings get a sponsor, work the steps, read the big book or the book of your 12-step program, pray in the morning, pray at night. These are just five basic principles that it takes to stay sober. And if you refuse to abide and be obedient to those principles, you most likely won't stay sober. And you'll wonder why. That reminds me of a judge who one time told me, he said, Bill, you and I both know this AA program don't work. And I said, yes, it does. And he said, well, look at all these people I have on probation that it's not working for. I've mandated them to go to meetings. I said, Your Honor, they're not working the program. That's why it's not working. If they would work the program and do what's told them to do, it would probably work. That's like giving a diabetic some insulin tablets and the guy refuses to take them. And you say, those insulin tablets don't work. I mean, it's insane the way we look at this thing. Your life's not working because of you. Very early into my sobriety, I was in college, and I had a 4.0 grade point average. And I tried everything in the world to keep that 4.0. It was so important to me. Well, one night, I stayed up to about 2 or 3 in the morning studying for a psych exam the next day. And what woke me up was my phone was ringing. As I reached for my phone, I realized that I had missed that test. I'd slept through it. Well, what I did is I picked up that phone. I didn't even answer it. I just slammed it down. I got up, I didn't pray, I didn't meditate, I didn't do anything. I just combed my hair, I picked up the phone and called the professor, and I lied to him. I told him I was on my way to take that test, and my van slipped off into a ditch, and that's the reason I couldn't be there for the test. 
And he told me, Bill, I sure hate to hear that that happened to you, but I still am going to drop you a letter grade because you missed that test. Well, I went in there and took that test. I aced it and got a B. There went my 4.0. That night I was at a meeting. It was a big round table where people sat around this table, and there was a woman right straight across from me listening to me whine about what a poor pitiful day I'd had while I was sitting on my pity pot. And when I got done telling them about this poor pitiful day, she looked across at that table at me and said, you know, Bill, you're not qualified for a good day. She said, you woke up angry, you didn't pray and meditate like you're supposed to, and then you lied to the professor, and then you come down here and tell us what a poor day you've had. You're not qualified for a good day. You know, if I could have got across that table, I would have strangled that woman, because I felt humiliated, but I wasn't humiliated. I was humbled. And I'll tell you this, I have never forgotten what she told me. I love it, because from that day forward, I started asking myself, am I qualified for this? Have I done those things necessary to get what I want? Have I been obedient to the spiritual principles to where I can stay sober? Have I done such and such? Have I worked hard and paid my bills on time that qualifies me to get credit? Have I done a fourth and fifth step, making a personal inventory and giving it to a person that would qualify me to get rid of these resentments and this guilt that I feel? If I haven't done that, I'm not qualified to feel at peace and ease as the big book tells us we'll feel after those steps. You see, each one of these steps qualifies you for the next step. Have I done the things necessary to get what I want? I got sober in a little town in northwest Kansas, but it was such a rich, traditionally motivated AA group. And we used to smoke in the meetings at that time. And I remember going up to this old timer and I told him, I said, you know, I don't really feel like I belong here. And he said, you don't? I said, no, I I don't think I'll be coming back. And he said, why don't you just try something before you do that? And I go, what's that? He said, why don't you, after the meeting empty the ashtrays into this coffee can, and when you're done with that, go in there and start washing dishes. And I thought, what? But I did it. After the meeting, I get up after every meeting and empty all the ashtrays, and I go in the kitchen and start washing dishes. Well, pretty soon people saw that, and somebody else came in and got their can, and they started helping me empty those ashtrays. And then somebody started drying dishes, and we'd start having a conversation. I got to know everybody, because see, prior to that, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I stayed by myself. I never got up and talked. Nobody knew me. But I did what this guy told me, and I qualified myself to feel a sense of belonging in that club because I did those things necessary that it takes to feel like I belonged. Why don't you take a moment and think about what spiritual principle or what are you fighting today? What thing in your life are you in a battle with? And once you figure that out, why don't you ask yourself, what spiritual principle would fix this? Just t- it only take about five or ten minutes. I know that we have a hard time stopping and paying attention nowadays, but just try this. If you're battling something in your life or something's not going right, why don't you just sit down and figure out what the battle is exactly and what spiritual principle would it take to make this thing go away? And then why don't you surrender to it? And if you're un- unwilling or unable to surrender to it at this time, just ask God to help you to be willing. That's what our sixth step says in the big book. And for those of you out there who feel like we're wrong and you're right, why don't you ask yourself this question? Can that many people be wrong and I'm right? So in closing, the single most important and highest way I feel a person can live on this earth is to accept and adopt and practice spiritual principles. And that, folks, is the secret to good living. Thanks for listening to The Recovery Effect with Bill Vineyard. Check out more at therecoveryeffect.com and facebook.com slash therecoveryeffect. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes.